Why is Good Friday? Good. Good Friday is good. Because the price we couldn't pay got paid and the stain we couldn't clean got clean. Good Friday is good because the world was without hope, but the lamb was without blemish. Good Friday is good because the worst thing that could ever happen was simultaneously the best thing that would ever happen. Good Friday is good because on that cross, on that day, the great shepherd of the sheep walked through the valley of the shadow of death for us. Good Friday is good because even though the cross isn't pretty, it's beautiful. Good Friday is good because if we have a king who would rather die for his enemies than kill them. Good Friday is good because I am not good, but he is. Good Friday is good because Friday is not the end of the story. Well, welcome here to everyone. My name is James. I'm the pastor here at Salem. And there's just a special welcome to all who are visiting here today from MB and just from the community and maybe from other communities as well. We're so glad that we can come together and worship our Lord and just remember the great sacrifice that Jesus has made on our behalf. Uh, we're going to begin with a time of worship in just a moment. But as the worship team makes their way forward, I want to read to us from the book of Revelation. Uh, where we see the lamb standing as though it had been slain before the throne, and they say, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning where we celebrate our Lord Jesus and the price he paid to secure our redemption through the shedding of his blood. Father, we thank you for the great love with which you loved us, how you sent your Son to die for our sins. And Jesus, this morning as we worship you, as we proclaim the good things that you have done, we pray that you'd help us to remember and to reflect upon the significance of this day. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, why don't you just rise with us? Shares of lightning roll. 
of strength and glory and power be to you the only wise King. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come.
began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the
salvation comes my way. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my right. It's just so awesome to be able to raise our voices together to sing praise to our God. What an, what an awesome experience that is. Uh, we're going to prepare now to participate in communion together. And so uh, I'm going to read to us a few passages in Matthew 27 to prepare our hearts for that. You can turn there if you want to or just listen along. But I'm going to read starting in Matthew 27, verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover, these are two festivals that happened every year back to back right at the same time. And they went all the way back to the Exodus when God rescued his people from slavery in Egypt. They went back to that first time when God passed over the houses of the Israelites and rescued them from slavery in Egypt. And so each year, God's people came together to the place that God appointed in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover together. Uh, the meal that they had was a reenactment. It was a remembrance of God's salvation that he gave to his people all those years ago. This is one of the few times in the year that everyone was supposed to come together to Jerusalem for this festival. And so Jesus and his disciples do this probably as they've done this years and years before. Except this time, Jesus, while they're eating this meal together, says something different. Uh, skipping down to Matthew 27, verse 26, it says this, Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So in this Passover meal that Jesus shares with his disciples, he takes the bread, he takes the cup, and he gives them new significance in his own death on the cross. And I think we read these words and we're think, okay, of course Jesus does this. What else would he do? But if you think about how shocking that would have been, for the disciples. They're having a meal that celebrates God's salvation in the, in the Exodus, something that God has done. And Jesus says, this bread and this cup, these are now about me. Think about how audacious that would be. Almost as if someone would say about, about the Lord's table that these things are now about me. We would say, how dare you say something like that? But Jesus can say it. Because his death on the cross is about to secure salvation for all who will believe. His blood is the blood of the covenant poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Uh, one commentator says, Just as Moses made a sacrifice for the people so that they might enter into a covenant with God, so also does Jesus inaugurate another covenant by offering his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And as it says in Isaiah 53 verse 12, He poured out his soul to death. And was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sins of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. 
Jesus' death on the cross secures salvation for all who would believe in him. What an incredible sacrifice that Jesus makes. And so when we celebrate communion, we look back to what Jesus has done. But we don't only look back, we also look forward to what is yet to come. In Matthew 27, verse 29, Jesus continues. He says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And so as we celebrate communion this morning, we look back to what Jesus has done, but we also look forward to that day when we will eat and drink with Jesus at that great marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, This communion meal gives us a lot to reflect upon, a lot to think about. And so what I want to do right now is just have a moment where we quietly, before the Lord, just quiet our hearts to reflect upon what this moment means, what it represents. Uh, to, to, To take a time to examine our own lives, to see if there's sin that we need to confess before the Lord, and just to give thanks to God for such an incredible gift. So let's just take a moment now silently before the Lord. Amen. Well, at this point, I'd like to call for those who are going to be helping out with uh, communion to to distribute the elements. And as they come forward, I'll just say that by taking the bread and the cup, a person is declaring that I believe in Jesus and I want to live my life to serve him and to follow him. I accepted his forgiveness in my life. And if that's a declaration that you are able to make this morning, we invite you to participate. Uh, But if you're not quite there in your walk with God, if you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to consider what Christ has done for you as the elements pass by. Uh, Please note that it is also our tradition to wait till everyone's been served, and then we we will eat uh, and drink together at the same time. So at this point, I'll call Owen up to pray for the bread. Pray with me. God, we thank you for your body broken, God. Lord, we thank you for um, what you've done on the cross, God. Lord, we recognize that the high cost that you willingly gave up for us, God. Lord, uh, thank you for what you've done on the cross. Pray a blessing over this bread. In Jesus' name.
Uh, just uh, a quick note, uh, we have been asked the bread is gluten-free, just in case that is a concern for anyone. Um, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Kevin, would you come and say a prayer for the cup? Pray with me. Lord, thank you so much um, for the blood that you spilled for us. Thank you that we can uh, drink together and remember the price you paid um, for our salvation. In your name.
In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment. We thank you that we can remember and celebrate Christ's death on our behalf. Father, and although there is a sadness as we reflect upon the suffering that Jesus had to endure on our behalf, Father, we thank you and rejoice what that accomplished. And Father, we pray that you'd help us to always remember, to always live our light, our lives in light of the fact of what Christ has done for us. We thank you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this point, I'm going to invite up Pastor Kim. And uh, Kim's going to be sharing a message this morning. I just want to say I've really appreciated getting to know Kim over the past couple of years now and just the friendship that we've been able to have and just the support we've been able to give to one another and just uh, the good times we've had. So I'm just going to pray for you, Kim, and just look forward to hearing what you have to share. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for Kim, and I just pray that as he prepares to speak you the words that you've given him this morning, that you would just speak powerfully through him. Father, I ask that you would just anoint him by your Holy Spirit to, to give us the message that we need to hear. Uh, would you be glorified in this time, and we pray that you would uh, just open our hearts to receive what you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Yes, I will uh, echo that, James. It's been... Um... It's been good getting to know you and, and to lean on you a little bit, to lean on each other. Um, COVID's not been an easy time to be a pastor, especially for a guy, A, who's never been a pastor before, and B, a guy who's moving from BC. And so uh, I've certainly appreciated you, and uh, it's been good. So, And so it is good to be with you here on this Good Friday. Now, what I love about this community service is that we're not gathering here as Salem Church or as MB Church, but as the church of Jesus Christ and we are united in the death of Christ and his resurrection amen yes now in 2005 uh, a movie called walk the line was released about the life of Johnny Cash in one scene a record executive asked Johnny he says what's with all the black you look like you're going to a funeral Johnny responds he says well maybe I am now in some respects our gathering today has the feel of a funeral. Thankfully, we know how the story ends, and so we don't stay in the place of grief and sadness over the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. But having said that, what I want to do here this morning is put the car in park and stay a while in the eclipse of the light, to take a knee at the foot of the cross with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I personally find Good Friday to be a somber day, it's a day that calls us into the suffering with our Lord Jesus. It's a reminder to not rush too quickly to the bright lights and the celebration of Easter Sunday. And so it's good to linger at the cross before moving to the empty tomb on this Friday that we so oddly call good. And so what did Jesus experience that day? Well, there was betrayal. There was false accusations. Standing alone when he should have been surrounded by friends. Beating, torture, pain. Having to, keep your, um, having to keep your mouth shut when you were more than able to defend yourself. And so the sky grows dark. There's despair, there's shame, and there's anguish. There was nothing good about this day for Jesus. And so let our hearts be broken by the unspeakable bad of this Friday that we call good. And so on this Friday, it's good to stay with our dying Savior for a little while. Now over the years, I've heard people over and over say how much they dislike confrontation. And you know what? I get it. It makes sense. Who needs all the drama and the messiness that comes with confrontation? But having said that, not all confrontation is bad. Now according to Google, the definition of confrontation is this. It's a hostile meeting or, or situation between opposing parties. This could be a face-to-face -face meeting, it could be the clashing of ideas, or something like a violent confrontation between rival gangs. Now, when I think of the cross of Jesus, I often think of confrontation. I'm confronted with some difficult things that, frankly, make me uncomfortable. 
First, I'm confronted with the fact that my sin had a role in putting Jesus on the cross. Secondly, I realize how little I bring to the table when it comes to my salvation. I'm powerless. We all are powerless. It appears that what I bring to the table is sin, weakness, fear, and insecurity. And lastly, I'm confronted with the depth of God's love. And I often think, and maybe you feel the same, how can this God love a person like me? I know who I really am and the things that I've done, and the list is pretty long. And yet this God, this Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has made a way for us to know him and live with him forever. Our sins remembered no more. Think about that. Our sins remembered no more. These, to me, are sobering thoughts. So as I said off the top, what we're going to do here this morning is we're going to spend some time at the foot of the cross. We're going to be looking at two passages. Uh, The first is in Matthew 27, starting in verse 45 through to 56. Matthew 27, 45 through 56. Now at noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. At about three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama, sabachthani. which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought that he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so that he could drink. But the rest said, wait, let's wait and see whether Elijah comes to save him. Then Jesus shouted again and he released his spirit. At that moment, the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart, and tombs opened. The bodies of many godly men and women who had died were raised from the dead. They left the cemetery after Jesus' resurrection, went into the holy city of Jerusalem, and appeared to many people. The Roman officer and other soldiers at the crucifixion were terrified by the earthquake and all that had happened. They said, this man truly was the Son of God. And many women who had come from Galilee with Jesus to care for him were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Now one of the main themes of this passage here is darkness. Darkness came over the land as it's clear that the Lord had caused it. It seems that creation was testifying to the gravity of of Jesus' death, while Jesus' friends and enemies, rather, fell silent amidst the gloom. It seems the darkness on that Friday afternoon was felt both spiritually and physically. Now, darkness has always held a strong correlation with death, and it's, it's fitting. Many have noted that our modern societies don't really know what to do with death. And so they, they say there are two main options here, and the secular option is to sort of pretend that death isn't real. To hide from it or try and run from it altogether. And we see this a lot in celebrity culture, where the answer is to try and cheat death in the aging process by things like plastic surgery and so on. But the religious option is no better. The religious answer has been to turn death into a, a welcome friend. The attempt is to sort of tame death, but neither of these uh, is sufficient or biblical. The Bible clearly sees death as a great enemy of humankind. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now in verse 46, when Jesus shouts, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's important to note here that Jesus was not questioning God. He was quoting the first line from Psalm 22, which is a deep expression of the anguish anguish that he felt when he took upon himself the sins of the world, which caused him to be separated from his father. And this is what Jesus dreaded as he prayed in the garden, to take this cup of suffering away from him. The physical agony of the cross must have been horrible, but perhaps even worse was the spiritual separation from his father. And it's for us that Jesus died this horrible death, both physically and spiritually. Now, as you know, Darkness and evil are still very rampant in the world today. And I think at times it's easy for us to overlook darkness and evil. But every once in a while, the fog lifts, 
And we remember how dark this world really is. Events like 9-11 or the war in Ukraine have this effect on us. The question is, why was there darkness over the land at Jesus' crucifixion? Well, throughout the Old Testament, when God sends darkness, it's because of his judgment on evil and sin in the world. You can look at Exodus 10, 23 for a little bit more on that. And, and here we read that darkness fell on all the land. It's my opinion that we will never understand the light of Easter until we come to der- uh, terms with the darkness of Good Friday. But darkness is not the only theme here in this passage. Darkness covers the land, but if we've been paying attention to the gospel writers, we should know that there is a great light to be found here in this terrible scene, even if we cannot detect it with our own eyes. In the words of Isaiah 53, verse 2, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him, and yet, here in the darkness hangs the light of the world. Jesus said so himself in John 8, 12. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is somewhat puzzling to me. John says that Jesus is the light of the world and that he he shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome him. But here we read from the sixth to the ninth hour that darkness was over all the land. And to make it more puzzling, we read in 1 John 1, 5 that God is light And in him, there is no darkness at all. But on Good Friday, there was no exception to where the darkness fell. And if we flip ahead in our Bibles to the book of Revelation, we read that when the kingdom of God has fully come, the great city of God will need no longer need the sun or moon moon to shine upon it. For the glory of God provides the light and the lamb is its lamp. Why is the lamb the lamp? Well, Jesus is the light of the world who has come to conquer our great enemy, death. But he doesn't do so with violence and destruction. He does so with the very things that we fear the most. Weakness, suffering, blood, and death. I'm going to say that again. Jesus conquers death with the very things that we fear the most. Weakness, suffering, blood, death. And finally, death. He does so as a lamb, a lamb that was slain. The light of the world carried his bright light down into the darkness of death itself. And it was his bright light carried down into the darkness that exposed the powers of death. He is the great conqueror. But that great conqueror first allowed death to conquer him for you and for me. Christ's death was accompanied by at least four miraculous events that we read in the text. First, it was darkness. Next, the temple curtain was torn in two. There was a great earthquake. And lastly, we read that many people were raised from the dead. Jesus' death simply could not have gone unnoticed. Everyone knew that something significant had taken place. Now, Isaiah 53 is an unbelievable chapter from the prophet Isaiah, considering that it was written 700 years before the time of Christ. In this chapter, we see all kinds of prophetic information about the work that the Messiah would do. The people, as we know, were looking for a Messiah who would come in power and glory and restore the national uh, fortunes of Israel. They would reject the idea that the Messiah should suffer for the people. The Emmaus disciples did not see this either until Jesus Jesus revealed it to them. They would, by God's grace, along with others, come to understand what this passage in Isaiah 53 taught. So let's go to Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care, and yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly. 
yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shears, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal and he was put in a rich man's grave. But it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Yet when his life is made an offering for sin, he will have many descendants. He will enjoy a long life and the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. When he sees all that is accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. He was counted among the rebels and he bore the sins of many and interceded for rebels. Now in verse 10, we read that it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him. How can this plan be any good? On the day that Jesus was executed, the disciples must have been thinking, what good can possibly come from this? It's all over. The last three years have been for nothing. It's done. What's so good about Friday? Well, in this same passage, we have our answer. In the same verse, it says that the Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. The Lord's good plan will prosper in his hands. The text says when he sees all that he has accomplished by his anguish, he will be satisfied. And because of his experience, my righteous servant will make it possible for many to be counted righteous, for he will bear all their sins. I will give him the honors of a victorious soldier because he exposed himself to death. I think sometimes we think of the cross and we often recoil. We plug our ears and we cover our eyes. We put the car in drive and we punch it. Get me out of here. I don't want nothing to do with any darkness. And so we hurry on to Easter. But we will not know what to do with Easter's light if we shun the friendship of the darkness that is wisdom's way to light. There would be no light if not for this darkness of the cross. Sunday's coming, and we need to celebrate that, no doubt. But I encourage you, stay at the cross for a while. Reflect on its darkness, but also reflect on its hope. For the way of the cross is the way home. It's the way home. And Good Friday, in my opinion, brings us to our senses. The truth about the crucified Lord is the truth about ourselves, isn't it? The real you, the real me. The ancient philosophers advise us, know yourself, for in knowing yourself is the beginning of, beginning of wisdom. To which the psalmist responds, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think we receive that same message today and we hear it in our culture as self-love. According to the Bible, the beginning of wisdom is to come to our senses and know the fearful truth about ourselves. That we have wandered away and wasted our days in a distant country, far from home, far from our Father. We know ourselves most truly in knowing Christ, for in Jesus we find our true self. His cross is the way home to the waiting Father. If you would come to your senses, he says, come and follow me. And so I ask you here this morning, what do you bring to the cross? What are you dragging behind you here this morning? It's likely deadlines and duties, the sin you can't seem to shake, the fear of failure, the hopes for advancement, love unreturned, plans disappointed, children gone astray, the marriage you just can't seem to mend, and so on. And so we come loping along with reality's baggage. And this is what we need to say, that I will arise and go to my Father, and I will say, 
Father, I have sinned against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son, and I'm not worthy to be called your daughter. And so this Christ takes our baggage and sin and hoists it upon his shoulders. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Earlier, Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. Bring me your baggage, Jesus says. That's exactly what I did on November 27, 1998, at roughly 2 a.m., very hungover and alone. Addiction had me in a headlock, and it wasn't letting go. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. But on this night, things would change. The Lord met me through a Christian television program where the host said there's a young man in his room who's all alone and tried to break free of this addiction and find peace in his life. I know you've tried different things and none of them have worked. And I'm here to tell you, the answer you're looking for is in Jesus Christ. I got on my knees and I gave my life to, life to Jesus in front, or in front of my couch in my living room. Jesus returned to the darkness to meet me, to walk me out of a dark hole and into the light. Where would I be without Jesus? I believe it would be death or jail. And so I ask you, where would you be without Jesus today in your life? So what's the big big idea of the message here? As we know, there's a lot of darkness in the world. All our solutions for getting rid of this darkness always seem to come up short. What we needed was for Jesus, the light of the world, to take our darkness upon himself. And so we place our hope in the light of the world, Jesus Christ, who defeated death by entering into it, that we might have relationship with the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Is that not amazing or what? So why do we call Friday good? Based on what I read in Isaiah 53, it's because it was the Lord's good plan to crush him once again. I just can't get over that. It was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. His own son. For you and for me. The death of Jesus on the cross, though terrible, contains a message of hope. For those of us in relationship with Christ, Romans 8.1 says it so well. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Amen. Isn't that awesome? And for those who don't yet know Jesus, there is forgiveness and a new chance at life. Because of what Jesus has gone through for you and for me. And so while the cross is a symbol of a grievous suffering and a torturous death, it is also a symbol of the great compassion of our God. There Jesus enters into the darkest of days in order to set us free from sin and death, free to live new lives in Christ. Sunday's coming, and I look forward to that celebration. I really do. But until then, let us reflect on the cross of Christ and all that he accomplished through his death. Again, for there is no light if not for the darkness of the cross. There is no light if not for the darkness of the cross. I'm going to call up the music team, and I'm going to pray. So that feels like that's fitting right now. Lord Jesus, Father, Holy Spirit, there is none like you, God. You are set apart. You are, you are unmatched, Lord, in, in power, in plan, in purpose, Lord. Um, Lord God, I'm thankful personally for my salvation, that I am alive today. Um, that you have blessed me and gifted me with a family, Lord, with a church, a community. Father, with salvation, Lord. And a hope, God. We live in a dark world, as you know. And Lord, I pray for our neighbors and our loved ones who don't know you, Lord. Where, where are they finding hope if not for Jesus Christ? Lord, help us to leave here today changed by what we've heard today, by your word, Lord. May we get urgent about sharing the gospel with our neighbors and our loved ones and do so in a loving way, Father. 
doesn't matter if it's awkward conversation, Lord. Just give us the boldness and courage to do these things that you have called us to do. The church is plan A, God. There is no plan B. So Jesus, we ask that you would give us courage and boldness, united as a church around the death and resurrection of our Lord. Father, we need you so bad in our world today. And may Salem Church and MB Church be beacons of light in our community and in the valley, God. United around the person of Jesus Christ. Amen.
it was a, a bit of a long wait before uh, I could finally see both churches coming together in person, but it was well worth the wait. What a great morning celebrating together. And my prayer is that what we experienced this morning would just go with us throughout the rest of our weekend as we celebrate our Savior's death and resurrection. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a great weekend and uh, God bless.